The Spitfire is definitely the most iconic British aircraft of the Second World War, and possibly of all time. It's seen as a symbol of defiance against the evils of the Nazis, and the victory of the underdogs against the Luftwaffe. A number of these aircraft still survive, however there are many more which were shot down or destroyed during the conflict. Today we look at the chilling story of a Canadian airman, who gave his life in one of these Spitfires. However his death, and the story of Spitfire BVBL655, is rather haunting, and could have been definitely avoided. Once again, to support our channel please make sure to subscribe. During the Second World War, and more particularly the Battle of Britain, the Spitfire for many was seen as a significant symbolic aircraft in the face of the Nazis. Its reputation during the Second World War as an epic fighting aircraft was echoed by the pilots who flew it, defending Britain from attack. Although we consider the Battle of Britain to be the British Royal Air Force pitted against the Luftwaffe, the pilots that flew Spitfires and Hurricanes were from many different nationalities too. An example is number 302 Fighter Squadron and number 303 Fighter Squadron, which were both heavily populated with Polish airmen, who had escaped Poland following the Nazi invasion and occupation. These pilots felt a duty to see off the Germans in a victory after hearing of the horrors from back home, and their fight against the Germans was personal. The Royal Canadian Air Force was another example that played a pivotal role alongside the RAF in the Second World War. It became the fourth largest Allied Air Force, and their links to the Commonwealth would see them thrust into service against the Axis in World War II. The Canadian pilots were a huge contributor to the British Commonwealth Air Training Plan, and were involved in operations in many places, such as Britain, Europe and North Africa. The rapid expansion of the RCAF meant that more than 131,000 airmen were trained, and a large number of these would fulfil their wartime service in Canada. However, a number of airmen would find themselves engaged in fit combat against German submarines in the Atlantic, for example. The first three Royal Canadian Air Force squadrons were sent to England during the first half of 1940, with number one fighting squadron arriving in time to participate in the Battle of Britain. Overseas, the RCAF also grew, and established a strong presence within the British formations of the Air Force. Inside these, they would find themselves in different roles, such as in British fighter squadrons, in defending the coast or in transport. There would be a large number of Canadian Air Force squadrons, but the largest concentration of Canadian airmen would service with the No. 6 RCAF Group Bomber Command. These would see themselves fighting alongside the RAF Bomber Command. Bomber Command controlled the RAF's bomber forces from 1936 to 1968, and saw an important role during the Second World War. They played an integral part of the strategic bombing of Germany during the conflict, alongside the United States Army Air Force. From 1942, the British campaign of bombing Germany became less restrictive, and they began to target industrial cities and areas focused on German war production. They have been criticised in the past for their role in inflicting civilian casualties in Germany, under the leadership of Bomber Harris. Allied bombing of German cities killed between 300,000 and 600,000 civilians. Each night in their height of their operations, huge sorties of aircraft would fly from Britain and drop their payload of bombs on German industrial towns, inflicting mass damage. Bomber Command crews themselves suffered an extremely high casualty rate, and flying one of the bombers was extremely risky. 55,573 airmen out of 125,000 were killed, which equates to a 44% death rate, and over 8,000 of them were injured. During the Second World War, over a third of all Bomber Command stations, where the bombers would be launched from, were based in Lincolnshire in England, and Canadian airmen were also based in this county too. Flying officer Norman Alexander Watt would have arrived in England from Canada, following the Battle of Britain. He was a very young man, aged only 21, and must have been extremely excited to have passed training, and to be travelling to Britain to join the fight of the Second World War. He had a couple of brothers, Alistair Watt, who had joined the Royal Canadian Air Force as well, would sadly die on March 17, 1945, towards the end of the conflict. 
also his other brother, Corporal Leslie Watt, would be wounded at Filet in France, and was repatriated back to Canada because of a nasty arm injury. In his very early 20s, Norman became a part of the 416 City of Oshawa Squadron. This squadron was formed in Aberdeenshire in Scotland in 1941, and during World War II saw service as a fighter squadron, being based at many different RAF stations across England, Scotland and later continental Europe. Norman would be based at RAF Digby in Lincolnshire, and there would be a substantial Canadian wing based at the station. There was a number of different fighter squadrons based there who flew Spitfires, as well as many other aircraft. The station would receive damage from German raids during the conflict, and it also had a long history as being a training facility. RAF Digby would later become RCAF Digby in 1942, when it was formally passed over to the Canadians. It would also play host to a number of visiting squadrons, such as the Czechs and Belgians. In fact, during the conflict it would have been the wartime home to 30 RAF squadrons, 13 Canadian squadrons, 4 Polish squadrons, 3 Belgians, and a Czech squadron as well. So when Norman Watt would have been based here in 1943, it would have been a hive of bustling activity with lots of outbound flights, inbound flights and training flights, all filling the skies above Lincolnshire. Being only 21 still, Norman would have been considered a rather inexperienced pilot, and as with all inexperienced pilots, they would be regularly sent out above the skies over Lincolnshire on routine training flights. On the morning of the 1st of July 1943, this was the case, and Norman Watt and two other pilots, R.D. Phillips and J.A. Shalott, would take to the skies in Spitfires to practice their skills as pilots. As mentioned, this should have been a routine practice as the pilots needed to develop their skills, However, tragedy would soon strike. The flight would set off at roughly around 10.40am and would be a simple training exercise. Norman Watt would be flying a Spitfire, one of the iconic Spitfires that sits in the memory of the British public. Half an hour would pass, however at around 11.10, contact was lost with Norman Watt's Spitfire. It's speculated that there was an issue on board with his fuel and that his aircraft was drastically short of fuel. It's also speculated that upon realising his lack of fuel, he flew to nearby RAF East Kirkby and requested permission to land. RAF East Kirkby after all was an RAF airbase, they're both on the same side and it was roughly only 25 miles from the Canadian airbase at Digby. However allegedly, this permission to land was denied mysteriously, and more on this chilling fall later. So with no fuel, no safe area to land in sight, Norman Watts Spitfire looked in dire trouble. He must have at that point turned his aircraft back towards his own base. Watt's two colleagues who were also on the training flight would spot him, however, it would be too late. They would watch in horror as the Spitfire plummeted towards the ground, and ploughed deep into the ground in a wheat field at Dorrington Fen, only six miles from the home base of RCAF Digby. The aircraft would hit the ground at such speed, they would bury deep into the soil of the Lincolnshire countryside. His body would be partially recovered, and it would be buried at Scotwick, with other Canadian casualties but the story of Norman Watt doesn't really end here yet. Flying officer Norman Watt Spitfire would later be recovered by aviation enthusiasts in 1989, 46 years after his aircraft plummeted into the Lincolnshire countryside. Today the aircraft sits at Lincolnshire Aviation Heritage Centre as a memorial to Norman Watt, however interestingly, this is based at RAF East Kirkby, the very place where Watt requested permission to land his doomed Spitfire, and where the request was subsequently rejected. If he had been simply allowed to land on the airfield, which was being used at the time by RAF Bomber Command, he would have easily lived, landing his aircraft on the runway. However, this denial ultimately cost him his life, and those who operated the command tower ultimately allegedly had the blood of Norman Watt on their hands. In fact, it's considered by some that the spirit of Norman Watt haunts RAF Kirkby and the Aviation Museum 
disgusted at the decision that cost him his life. Today the remains of Spitfire BL655 sits chillingly in the museum, offering us an insight of the damage that was sustained when the plane hit the ground. It's a mess of mangled and twisted metal, with the propeller completely broken and the engine mangled. You can still make out that it's an aircraft, however when you look at it, you can't help but remember the young 21 year old man who died sitting in the aircraft's cockpit. For that man's fate could have been so different if the simple request would have been allowed to let him land his aircraft. This denial to land would ultimately result in the loss of his life and his future being ripped away from him. Once again thank you for watching. To support our channel please make sure to subscribe. Once again thank you for watching.